Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. In the, in the study of the book of Romans now. Hallelujah. And we finished last week, we kind of just finished up where, uh, who know in the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Yeah, there we go. All righty. Um, I'm going to read some because the next verse starts in chapter 2. It says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, that whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same thing. Now here is a qualifier for this statement. We are told in the Word of God to judge things. Paul said, I judge, if I judge, my judgment is just. So if he comes back here and says, who are you that judges? If you judge another, doest thou the same. And then people come, see, you're not judging anybody. Judge not, lest you be judged. We, we've got to take all that's said about this subject together. The judgment we are not to engage in is either self-righteous judgment or unjust judgment. That is a judgment we don't. So if someone's out living in sin and you say that is sinful, you shouldn't be doing that because the word of God says don't do that, that is not an unjust or a self-righteous judgment. But if you're judging in order to make yourself look better, yeah, look at you, you're doing this, da, 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 da. now that is a self-righteous or unjust judgment. Okay. Um, let's, we'll pick up verse 32, uh, this commentary from the Complete Legal, Biblical Library, no longer in print, but can be gotten offline as a word, not a word press, but a word something edition. You, it's, it's available in electronic form now. Um, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 32, their commentary. Here the climax is reached. This verse sums up all, verse 32, it says, uh, who knowing the judgment of God, they that which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. If y'all don't mind tonight, I'm going for, for, uh, off and on I may do this. I don't, I'm not sure how long. I like standing. I like moving around. I like getting close to you. But I may sit right here uh, for some of this reading. Because there's, there's, there's a, a good portion of reading, and it's, but it's beneficial. And so, and, and I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there's, there's a minister up in, uh, up in the Midwest. He started his church. He has 600 churches under him now. He started his church reading Brother Hagin's books. They come to church on Sunday, sing some songs. He pick up a book and read a book. See y'all next week. Verse 32 of chapter 1, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Commentary. Here the climax is reached. The verse sums up all that has been written beginning with the verse 18. The most degraded persons are not destitute of the knowledge of God and his righteous judgment. God's wrath has been revealed to man and yet man ignores his judgment. Man goes all out in iniquity, revels in it, boasts in it, and has pleasures in others which do the same. This is the climax of sin. Man may deny the accusation and try to evade it, but the man is guilty and without excuse. Degeneracy and disaster go hand in hand. The rebellion of fallen men is epitomized in that they find pleasure in iniquity. Iniquity, boy, have you ever seen people who really get into sin, and I'm talking about perverse sins, how they revel in it and how they boast about it and how they uh, in your face with it. Iniquity is most prevalent when it is not controlled or dis, uh, by the disapproval of others. Now, don't think that the demand that everybody tolerate every kind of sin is, is a mistake. Here, this makes it very clear. The, um, the rebellion of fallen men is epitomized in that they find pleasure in iniquity. Iniquity is most prevalent when it is not controlled by the disapproval of others. In other words, if we got to accept that people are normally perverted, then there's no disapproval for their action. And if you disapprove of it, you're condemned by everybody now. Now it's the PC thing. I mean, some guy was upset over the guy getting drafted who was gay. Tweeted on his tweet and got um, suspended 
because he disapproved of it. So you can't have an opinion other than the PC crowd, which is really the devil crowd. It is, it, the, the PC crowd is demon controlled. Um, but it rather receives aberration and applause. One has only to observe the plots of popular entertainment to know that unregenerated men love sin as pigs love mud and dogs love their vomit. Those who enjoy seeing others sin show that they hate their fellow man because they know that, uh, that such sin risks damnation. Rebellious human beings not only are bent on damning themselves, but also stay busy seeing to it that others will also be damned. Thus they judge themselves worthy of eternal death. Moving into chapter 2, thou art excusable, O man. After charging the Gentiles with sin and guilt in chapter 1, Paul now speaks to the Jews. Now see, Paul now has moved to speaking to Jews. The Gentile who rejected God's revelation of himself in nature were without excuse. But the Jews who had God's revelation in the law were also inexcusable. While the Jews are not named earlier in the chapter, it is evident from verse 17 and on that the principles of divine judgment, that's what we find in chapters 2 through 1 through 16, are applied to the Jew and his covenant status. The Jewish moralist were as guilty of practicing sin as were the Gentile heathen. The main differences were in the degree of knowledge possessed by each group and in the hypocrisy of the moralist or the Jewish moralist. While the pagans openly approved of the sins of others, the moralists pronounced judgment and pretended to hate sins. Fallen man can no more stop sinning than he can stop breathing. All, man asks, all God asks is that humanity accept the one who saves from sin. The common usage of inexcusable, uh, anapologetos, came to mean defenseless. Thou art inexcusable or defenseless. The self-righteous man is defenseless. Judgment has the basic meaning of decision as used here indicates a judicial verdict with the sense of a sentence of condemnation. The emphatic meaning of thou is thou of all men. This is an expansion of the revelation of the wrath of God to include another class of men, namely every man who passes judgment. The self-righteous moralist represented by the Jew is as guilty of, uh, as the idolatrous Gentile. They practice or do the same things that they condemn. Here is the key. This is not a pastor getting up and saying to live in homosexuality is a sin. That is not an unjust or self-righteous judgment. It's actually a warning and a, and a bid to be delivered from going to hell. Amen. Amen. The self-righteous moralist neither, uh, knows neither God's holiness or, nor man's sinfulness. The sin of judging and boasting is born of self-justification and indicates an unwillingness to recognize God's condemn condemnation of all we who are, uh, all we are as fallen men. To, to look at someone and go, you're sinful, look at me, I'm not as bad as you, is unrighteous. It's not about who's, who's doing more. To say, and I've had people, I, I've been accused of this, not that long ago, this year, you know, that, that for me to say something about homosexuality is not lo the love of God, it's, it's, there's more to the gospel than saying that, that homosexuality is wrong. Well, whatever you want to think, it's my job to preach the gospel. And if churches are accepting that, if churches are endorsing that, it's, then, then the churches who will preach the truth have to stand up and say, you're wrong. Because if they're not, if, they're, if people are going to churches and being told they're okay to live in their sin, that, that God, you know, um, my wife read to me today that, um, you know, preachers in America who preach that God judges nations or judges individual uh, are, are liars, said it in a mega church here in America, in the state of Texas. It was a mega church. He's got a mega church overseas. Now, he claims to, to, to have Dad Hagen as a spiritual father. <laughs> Dad Hagen 
was one of the people who stood up and, as a prophet and said that, you know, that uh, God, God has to judge sin and, and nations, and the only thing that will save America from judgment is repentance. This guy comes along and says, then any American preacher, it's just, just American preachers preach judgment. Well, where's 90%, where's 90 percent of the gospel come from around the world? Skinny jeans. Anyway. <laughs> the emphatic, okay. Man's judgment can only be partial. For he does not have all the facts. Paul, Paul describes in this chapter four simple principles upon which men are judged according to the truth, according to his deeds, that there's no respect or persons with God. That doesn't, that means if the preacher does it or the lay person does it, it doesn't matter with God, it's wrong. If it's wrong, it's wrong no matter who does it. In America right now, uh, if, if you do it as a citizen and it's wrong, if the Congress does it, it's okay. How many have ever heard the term insider trading? That's getting special knowledge ahead of time and, and trading on Wall Street based on knowledge that you had that benefits you. You can go to jail for insider trading. Congress has exempted itself from insider trading laws. They can do it and get away with it. That's how they get rich. As a matter of fact, they do it. They're the ones who should be going to jail because what they're doing is they're getting inside information and then passing laws that make it work so they can get rich. Now, with God, if the preacher is in adultery or the lay person is in adultery, it doesn't matter. It's sin to him. And the preachers don't get away with it just because they're the preacher. God did go, oh, well, you're one of my servants. Ask Eli. Hello. His sons were, were stricken at the door, to the, at the gate to the temple, or the curtain to the temple, and he fell over and broke his neck. Matter of fact, God takes it out more seriously on the preachers. Okay, so according to... Uh, there's no respect to persons, and then according to Paul's gospel, God's judgment is made according to truth. According to the facts of the case, according to reality, it is made by God's standards. The, this, this, the hypocrite, the self-righteous judgment, the one he is addressing here, not someone who's saying that according to the word of God, this is sin. You're wrong if you take the love of God and tell people that they're okay to keep sinning because you can't judge anybody. The hypocrite is indignant at other people's failure, but indulgent of his own. Did y'all get that? The hypocrite is indignant at other people's failure, but indulgent of his own. The answer to the rhetorical question, do you think you will escape the judgment of God, is an emphatic no. No. Okay, so we've gotten there. Wouldn't that just bless your heart? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without, I'm sorry, no, 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 Romans chapter 2. Um, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them. That, uh, did I read that far? I didn't. I read verse 1. Verse one. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For that thou that judgest doest thou the same. There it is. There is the whole premise to this statement. It is not that you can't judge things. It is, are you doing the same thing and then judging them for it? Are you being indignant about theirs but indulgent in yours? Just like the people who brought the woman caught in the very act and left out their buddy who had to be with her if she was in the act. Ain't no way around it. Hello? But they want to kill her. It's a cover-up. Hello? It's one of the Sanhedrin Five or something. I mean, it was one of the big guys down at the, down at the temple. He, she's in there with him, and, 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 you know, I can't think of a good song. Singing. They, they, they must, they must hear some outside saying, let's get it on. Anyway, 
came by, heard that, went in, checked the car, caught them in the very act and grabbed her and left him. Are you seeing Mrs. Jones? No. I'm going to have to stop that. I got the whole church doing it now. Self-righteous judgment is ungodly. And see, the Jews were moralists that, you know, that, you know, Jesus talked about that. You know, you stand, you beat your chest, you do all this stuff. You want to make sure everybody knows that you're fasting. And then the other guy comes and says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Which one leads, leads right before God? The, the one who was humble. Remember that? The Pharisees stood there. Hey, I fast often and I do all this and, you know, uh, all this kind of stuff. And I don't wash my face so I appear to fast. And Jesus, Jesus said, there's one over here beating the chest. Be merciful to me, God. I'm a sinner. And he says, which one is justified before God? Is the one who's, being, who's humbling himself. So there were a lot of moralists in the Jewish community. Uh, they, they wanted to stone the woman. They, and Jesus started writing on the ground. They, 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 always the suspicion was he was writing out their sin. They started, he was, which is out of sin, cast the first stone. And here with this, this judgment, understand this now, this judgment was to condemnation. When I preach that living in, living in adultery, that drinking, getting high, smoking dope, shooting up, you know, uh, living in fornication, committing homosexuality, if I preach that that is a sin, it is not to your condemnation, but to your awakening so that you can be redeemed from your place in a state and be born again and be delivered from that. Not trying to send you to hell, trying to keep you from going there. See, the world, see, the world's just messed up. The world says to say that something is wrong is wrong. But to let them do what they want to do, they call it tolerance and love because you don't want to make anybody feel bad. Now, I'll be honest with you. The Bible says godly sorrow, wor sorrow worketh repentance. So the love of God demands a repentance and a rejection of lifestyles that will send you to hell. So to tell someone that what they're doing is sinful is not hate speech or condemning or lack of love. It is the manifestation of love as a warning so that they can become out of that. Accepting what they do never has helped people get free. Just because ate, Jesus ate with publicans and sinners did not mean he condoned what they did. As a matter of fact, if you listen to Jesus' sermons, he did not condone sin. Never condoned sin. What did he tell his disciples to go preach? The 70. When he sent the 70 out, what was the thing he told them to go say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. The closer the kingdom of heaven comes to coming in the manifestation in the next dispensation on the earth, the closer people who are living in sin come to meeting a destructive end. Because those who are attached to sin, when pure holiness shows up and manifests itself in the earth, what do you think the fervent fire is? It's the fire and per fervency of God, purging if you're sinful, now listen, we're not saying you missed it last week and you, you know, stubbed your toe and said a bad word. Okay? We're talking about practicing living in sin. You're living in fornication and going to church and think you're okay. Shooting up, drinking, smoking dope. Going to church and thinking you're okay. You're not okay. You're in, a, you're in a state of rebellion against God. But I prophesied. Did not Jesus say that people will come and go, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And he will say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Huh? 
Yet we've got people running around telling everybody it's okay to live in sin. It doesn't work that way. Everybody say it doesn't work that way. All right. So, verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. He here reiterates that the judgment by people that is not acceptable is self-righteous judgment. Thinkest thou, O man, that thou, them that judgest which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? So you can't jump in here and go, well, everybody that judges do, does the same thing. That's not, that's not what he's saying. And you're wrong. There is a demand here that judgment is made according to truth. Not to excuse yourself. Amen. Now, if the, if the pastor's getting up preaching against adultery and he's living in adultery, he falls right into that category. He's going to get judged. I mean, he's going to get judged and bear a stronger judgment. I personally believe that, that ministers, that shepherds and ministers who, who live in sinful lifestyles, are going to bear a heavier judgment in this life. And I don't care what somebody says that God doesn't judge people or nations. You just hadn't read your Bible. That's the same person who said, if we could get rid of the Old Testament, everything would be okay. That's a little paraphrase, but that's basically what he said. Folks, Paul called the Old Testament scriptures. Peter called them scriptures. Paul preached the Old Testament and gave New Testament revelation to it. So we need it. As a matter of fact, Hebrews says the, the Old Testament was written as an example for us. How could it be an example for us if we don't have it? But see, it doesn't fit their narrative, their little grace narrative. It's, it's wrong. I love the grace of God. Thank God for the grace of God. But I, if you go study historically the word grace... Uh, in classical Greek usage, and then when it was brought into the New Testament, we, they favored, people took in, in, in interpreting that, that word later in history, just the favor part. That word had other meanings other than favor, even in classical use. But they just took the, the, the unmerited favor part and made it that, and that, that became their whatever. You got favor on you no matter what. You can despise the grace of God. You can turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. All right? And preachers who are living one lifestyle and judging another. I'm not talking about, listen, you understand this? Sometimes people struggle with stuff and they're, they're before the Lord, help, I, I need to, I'm dealing with this and I'm not winning, you know, and they're, they're getting help. That's, listen. Thank God they're, they're asking for help. And God will help them. And God will send people to help them. But you just live in a self-righteous indig in, you know, indignation all the time about you know, this person is living in this kind of sin. And you're living in it yourself. You're, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. Or, verse 4, or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing the goodness of God leadeth men to re leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impotent heart treasures up thyself against wrath, against the day of wrath and, judge and revelation and the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to the, his deeds. The word war or, or introduces the alternative. It, it, is your estimate of God's goodness such that you have a license to sin? Three words stand out for those who are trifling with the mercy of God. The term here for goodness is cruston, loving kindness, rather than the usual agathos, rebuke or discipline. Forbearance is the word for cessation of hostility, but with a limit, giving an opportunity for repentance. Oh, wow. It's a cessation to give you the opportunity to repent. Hear this word forbearance. You despise the riches of his goodness and his forbearance. God's forbearance is to give you time to repent. What's, what, what's in implied there is this. 
He demands repentance, and your, his judgment is withheld to give you an opportunity to repent instead of an automatic judgment for what you did. And we know that. We know. That, and that's what, listen, do you not understand that when God uses a minister to say that this is a sin, what he is doing, that is his forbearance, and his word is being delivered to you to give you the opportunity to repent. Why? So you can avert the judgment that will come if you don't. God loves people. God doesn't want his judgment to come on people. But it will. See, the moralist wants, wants God to cook them. Right there on the spot. Catch them. Take, I mean, catch them, clean them, and cook them. Without the cleaning part. Just catch them and cook them. Catch them in the act and take them out. That's how the, that, that's how the Jewish moralist was. It delivered them. Okay. Long-suffering or patient expresses patient with people. God's kindness is always active in the pursuit of repentance. Okay? Verse 4 and 5. I didn't read 5. Um, yeah. But after the hardness of thy heart, Hardness and impotent heart treasures up thyself wrath against the day of wrath and, and the revelation of God's judgment. Verses 4 and 5 uh, set forth sharp contrast. Repentance and impotence. Despising riches of goodness and treasuring up wrath. God's goodness is manifested to lead, present tense in the Greek, to repentance. It is a continuing activity. God's always trying to lead people to repentance. This is, where we, this is really where we veer off and get into trouble. Because people think that God's goodness or God's long-suffering or God's mercy are so they can continue to indulge. But what they really are is a beckoning and an opportunity to come to repentance. Not to continue towards judgment, but to veer from that because of his forbearance, because of his long-suffering, that the view of God is that he's going to give you an opportunity and he's going to be long-suffering in, in, in drawing you to the place of repentance and leaving that lifestyle behind. So when someone says adultery is sinful, it is not judgmental. It is the word of God to that individual within the forbearance of God, staying his judgment in a time to give them an opportunity to repent. That's his love. His love does not condone or permit them to continue in the action with his sanction. That is not the love of God. The love of God is staying the judgment of God in order to give that person an opportunity to come to themselves by the word of God. It's only going to be by the word of God. If we don't, well, all we got to do is tell people God loves them. Telling them God loves them does not tell them that what they're doing is wrong. It just means he loves them. And what a lot of people do, I saw a bumper sticker. I forgot where I was. Sometimes you just kind of want to get, you know, feel like Worf from Star Trek. Ramming speed, you know. It said, it, said, uh, it, it, was, it was one of our liturgical churches in America. And it's, it said, God loves everybody. No exceptions with this particular denomination has, has embraced homosexuality. Let me, let me say something. If you're a homosexual and you think I don't like homosexuals, you're just wrong. I love you. I don't love you in some perverse way. I love you with the love of God. I love you enough to tell you that if you continue in your lifestyle, you will go to hell. Not because I hate you, not because I'm mad at you, not because I'm disgusted with your sin, but because the word of God tells me that and that it is my obligation to inform you that if you do not repent and change your ways, that you will be caught in the condemnation and damnation that will come on humanity, that of lost humanity, and God will bring judgment on you. It's not because I hate you. But that is the word that you need to hear because you need to repent. And God has been forbearing with you to give you an opportunity to acknowledge your sin, repent from it, come to him and be delivered from it so you can walk in holiness and walk in his kingdom. 
hate speech, hate speech. Who do you think is motivating people to say that? The devil. Why? Because he wants to take you to hell. He wants you to burn in hell. He wants you to suffer for eternity. He hates you. He's not for you. And his demonic motivations and anti-Christian and anti-God and anti-Bible stuff is motivated by the enemy so that you will shut that down. And when somebody says something, that's a hate speech person, when really they love you enough to tell you the truth. You are judged according to the truth. And the truth says that no homosexual, different translations, more, more modern translations use the word homosexual rather than effeminate or other words, those without natural affection, shall not. It says no homosexual shall ha and, and adulterer and murderer. If you, and if you don't repent for all those things, you're going to go to hell. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And people who tell you that you will are liars. Because the Bible says they don't. And here we have this, this you know, passage that, to the moralists who, who want to exalt themselves and say that I'm okay no matter what I'm doing, but you're wrong because I, I, you know, that's wrong. Uh, that, that God's goodness, you know, is, is love and kindness. Forbearance is the cessation of hostility with a limit, giving an opportunity for repentance. That is the most, most powerful things that we need that people to understand. God is forbearing you. He is not condoning your actions. Everybody say, wow. Say it backwards. Wow. Say it upside down. Mom. Hallelujah. Remember, in the long surfing, long surfing. No, we're not surfing today. Long suffering or patience, coming from the Greek mac macrothumia, macrothumia, expresses patience with people. God's kindness is always active in the pursuit of repentance. God is extending himself in mercy and loving kindness and patience in order to, and forbearing his judgment in ordering, in order to allow the person to come to repentance. That is not the same thing as condoning it. When you have a child who's been doing things wrong and you go to them and, and, and you say, you can't do this anymore. I'm, gonna give you, I'm not going to throw you out in the street and shoot you. But you've got to stop. I'm going to give you some leeway here. You're going to, you're on a tight leash, but you're on a leeway. I'm going to give you an opportunity to demonstrate that you've changed. Repented. I'm going to give you some room. Okay? That is forbearance. That is not condoning what they were doing. There's a big difference. And what a lot of people preach today about the love of God, not, not everybody, but a lot of people do, what the love of God and the grace of God is, is the condoning of it. In other words, because what they say is, because God doesn't judge, because there is no judgment and that you can't do anything to make God not love you and that no matter what you do, if you're a Christian, you're going to heaven, they're saying God condones it because it doesn't matter. Yet God says there's a judgment for it. All right. Uh, let me get here from the end of that word. So verses 4 and 5, I, did I, I started reading this. I must have gone back up. Uh, sets forth sharp contrast, repentance and impotence, despising the riches of goodness, treasuring up wrath of God's goodness is manifested to lead, present tense, to repentance. It is a continuing activity. As men continue to despise God's goodness, they amass an accumulation of divine wrath. Day by day, a new deposit of wickedness is stored up for judgment in a coming day. For me to come back and say, don't do such and such, because I love you, because I don't want you storing up more and more wrath for the day of judgment. The phrase impotent heart occurs in no other New Testament passage. It means unrepentant. This is the apex of sin. And we've got preachers saying that we don't repent. And here, God, you know, um, uses the word, the impotent heart. 
But after thy hardness and impotent heart, unrepentant. God wants repentant hearts. Treasurous has the meaning of a place of safekeeping, a treasury or a storehouse. As the word developed, it came to mean the treasure which was stored. But the word here is the verb visazorio. Uh, uh, that's just I mutilated it. V sorizo. V sorizo. It, it has the basic meaning. The what now? Psoriasis. It has the basic meaning of laying up, keeping in store, of storing. And what is stored up? God's wrath. His wrath is the abhorrence of wrong. His holiness and character require that unrepented and unforgiven sin must come under the judgment of his wrath. Now, I don't know how going around denying that God judges people and only saying that God loves you. Hello. It's like the, 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 sin, the, the adulterous spouse running off and doing whatever they want to do with anybody they want to, and uh, that spouse at home just says, I love you, with no demands if you got to quit doing that. No, you have to quit doing that. <laughs> or in some cases, you'll get shot or cut. I love you. Well, you know, you hear sometimes testimony, well, they love me and I quit. And, nine, and then out of the 99, oh, 99%, they say I love you and they just keep doing it. Hello. We cannot misconstrue God's love for acceptance of actions. God loves the person. God does love the person. He sent Jesus to die for them. He abhors. Here's the thing. He abhors what they do if they're living in sin. He abhors things that are contrary to his holiness. He abhors things that, are, that, are, that are, his word says are wrong. And at some point in time, his wrath will come on that. And if you're attached to it, you're going to get cooked. So at that, that point, the only question is, um, you know, fried or extra crispy? Verse 6 and 7 and 8. I can't get It's hard to uh, Verse 6. Who, who will render to every man, every man according to, to his deeds. Verse 6 and 7. I, then I, I didn't read 7. Uh, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. And what's coming on them? Indignation and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Now I'm going to have to stop here and pick up next week, all right? Um, but notice, he will render to every man according to his deeds. God don't judge anybody. He'll render to every man according to his deeds. To them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what's coming on them? Indignation and wrath. Well, God's not judging me for living in this adultery. God's not judging me for doing this. God's not judging me for splitting churches. God's not judging me for speaking against the pastor. You're storing up. You're storing up wrath against that day. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not interested in storing up wrath. Are you, sunshine? Because indignation and God loves everybody. He's not going to do anything. He don't judge anybody. Tear Romans out of your Bible. Because if you don't believe he's going to, you can't read Romans. Hello? 
And it's wrong to tell people that because then they start thinking it's all right to do whatever they're doing and that there's no consequences for it when the Bible says you're, 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 you're storing it up. Why does it say that? Because you didn't get, why? Because you didn't get nailed when you did it. How many remember growing up, somebody say God's name in vain or something like that, and they step back and say, lightning's going to get you. Well, no, there's forbearance. God's giving people a chance to repent. God's giving them a chance to repent. Well, you keep living that way and don't repent, and you have an impotent, unrepentant heart. You just keep storing up for, for against that day of judgment, and you're going to get indignation and wrath. But we don't want that. And we don't want anybody to have that. So what do we do? We give them what the Word says as a warning so they will awake. Amen? All right. We're done. Praise God. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or Using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.